We good? Let's pray. Lord, once again, we turn to you and praise your name. We turn to you and seek your, your word. We already have your favor. We already know that, that you've, you've been the one that has drawn us in when we were uh, fighting and resisting you. And you're the one that's still speaking to us loud and clear, even though our, our hearts and our ears, our, our very being has built in resistances to you. We confess that. We pray that you would forgive that. Forgive the ways we've, we resist you. Forgive the ways um, that we have excuses to... to the, the numbers of times we've said, but I don't hear from the Lord. We know you're speaking. We know that even the stones will cry. And so we're the problem. We pray you would forgive these things, not just so we feel better, but so that you can be glorified. That we could receive your word, be filled with your spirit, and walk the battlefield with your banner. We pray your word would be open to us today, that the blessed teaching of the apostles, which has been the root of what's kept the church sharp and standing on truth, the same apostles' teaching, which it's been the source of inspiration that produced the Bible by the Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, you would allow it to be unleashed into our fellowship. That by faith alone, we would say yes to the things that are taught. That we don't have to be the ones that make everything up. That we don't have to be a special um, me generation where everything begins and ends with us. Rather, humbly, we <coughs> jump in the river, the living stream of what Jesus has inaugurated by your will, Father. Bless us with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, that we can be united, that we can walk, Lord, in the fullness of the revealed truth in Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Okie doke. I redid our schedule because the dates were all wrong last week, so go with the schedule that's on your page this week, not last week. Um, and. I've consolidated a few things, so we will be teaching about the Son, the, the Son of God, um, for three weeks. We're going to take a week off during Thanksgiving, then we're going to talk about the Holy Ghost, and then um, in December we'll talk about the church and communion. On the 14th of December we'll discuss forgiveness of sins, and then the 21st we will talk about everlasting life and resurrection. Uh, before we get into the study, I want to make an announcement uh, that this morning Jack Schneider passed away, and uh, we need to continue to be in prayer for Jody and his family. I'll be meeting with the family today. Services should be for uh, Monday morning, or late morning, or early afternoon. We'll get the word out as soon as we know. Okay. So, last, again, just to recap, we've, we've discussed that when we're referring to the apostles' teaching, we're not referring to everything anyone could ever say about God. We are referring to the most elementary and yet critical fundamental teachings that are revealed by Jesus himself, by the Holy Spirit, and the prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, when Jesus walked the earth, he said these things. And then the apostles of Christ's church were filled with the Spirit to agree on these things. And so, if you're, for instance, if you are called into an apostolic ministry, you may not always overtly be teaching the creed, but you will never teach against the creed. This is assumed. When someone says, I'm a Christian, this is a really good measuring stick. Okay, you've got fruit. Are you attracted to the Father? Is the Holy Spirit bearing fruit on you? That's fine. That's wonderful. Doctrinally, let's talk. And if they're like, well, I can't believe in the virgin birth. Okay. What? <laughs> or, I don't believe in the Trinity. And so the apostles' teaching, the apostle, which was the foundation of the church in Acts 2.42, we know the first day of Pentecost, the church was filled with the Holy Spirit. 3,000 came into faith. They, were, they didn't have the Bible. The Bible wasn't handed to them yet. They didn't have all sorts of things. They had four things that they felt compelled to be committed to and devoted to. One was the apostles' teaching. The second was to prayer. The third was to eating. And the fourth, or breaking bread. 
The fourth was fellowshipping, sharing life together. That some of the communities did that very seriously, or communistically, all things in common. But the first of the list was the apostles' teaching. And so when you boil down the core of what Scripture teaches, the core um, of what all the other creeds say, the Apostles' Creed is the most uh, condensed version. And you'll see these things obviously taught in Scripture. Today we're talking about the Son of God. Last week we talked about the Father. Again, the Father is the one who creates, provides, and governs. Uh, the Son, and here's your first blank, the Son of God is the power and means of the Father's will. He's the how. The Father, if we want to go Trinitarian in terms of uh, in some way, we reflect the image of God. We are made with bodies. We are made with, with souls. And then we receive a spirit, the same spirit of Christ at the moment of salvation. The Father is the heart or the soul. He's the control room of the Trinity. These are not in your notes, so don't worry. The Son is the body. He is the expression of the heart. He's the movement of the heart. The second bullet here is... If the Father, and, and there are three things for this blank, if the Father creates, provides, and governs, the Son is the way the Father enacts these things. That brings to mind what scripture? John 14, 6. When you, it's kind of a reverse effect. If you've been consuming scripture long enough and then you walk away for a minute and just reside in the truth, reside in the revealed, the Apostles' Creed or a sermon, the preacher doesn't have to say a word. When I say Jesus is God the Father's way, all these scriptures start hitting off. That's why they all work in concert together. Jesus mentioned, um, Often, I say what the Father tells me to say. I go where the Father tells me to go. I do what the Father tells me to do. The, the, one of the great hymns in, first, in uh, Philippians 2, 6 through 11, is that Jesus, when he set aside his crown, he, he uh, made himself the form of a servant or a slave. He emptied himself and became, what's the O word? Obedient. He became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Who is he obeying? God the Father. Got a few blanks here. The third bullet. In the Old Testament, we see it quite a bit. Jesus Christ is the Word of God, the Lamb of God, the Heavenly Bread. These are just a few examples. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. The Lamb of God, the heavenly bread. And most, many more than that. These are just three primary Old Testament examples. Are you saying the heavenly bread? Or bread, yes. Bread from heaven. Or manna. And the reason I say those three is those were the explicitly three ones, three that Jesus said he was. The word of God. We see in stories where, well, obviously creation account, where the Father wanted creation, willed creation, the way he did it, the how, like through his word he made. He spoke his words. I have spoken. The word is Jesus Christ. Um, we, and there are accounts of stories in the Old Testament where the, the word of the Lord comes through a prophet. And then it's so. Speaking the word, it's so. Um, I've mentioned before when Elijah's on Mount Horeb, he first encounters the word of the Lord before he encounters the Lord. 
So he encounters Jesus Christ, and then he encounters the Lord. <laughs> then you could stretch it and really pray about it, but who was, who was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Was it an angel, or was it Jesus? You know, there's, you start stretching that a little bit. Take your time. Don't, don't get hurt. Um, <laughs> but the word, of the, the word of God is Jesus, and Jesus is the Word of God, the Lamb of God. This is most commonly seen at the table. When Jesus says, this is my body, which has been given for you. We'll reiterate that with bread. But what was the meal that they were celebrating that night? The Passover. You have all these images of Abraham being told to go sacrifice his son Isaac. And right before he does it, his hand is stayed. And the father provided a lamb. You have or a ram. You have all these provisionary. I'm. Jesus is saying, in the in the most foundational way, the most uh, moving way, when when God shows up and intervenes in your life with a provision or a way in the desert or some miraculous event, Jesus says that was me. It was my blood on your doorpost. It was me that God fed you with in the desert. It was me. We don't live by bread alone, but by every word that the Father gives. Jesus is the means. The, 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 uh, God has all these great ideas, which would, the Father has all these great ideas, which would be meaningless without Jesus, without the rubber hitting the road. Uh, Jesus is how God puts his money where his mouth is. Uh, for God so loved his, the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's, it's all the giving, all the intervention, all the... It's Jesus. Jesus. You start reading the Old Testament from that perspective. You're like, wow, is Jesus the pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day? I mean, you start looking at all these Old Testament things, start testing them, start questioning, praying in the Spirit. Jesus, where are you? Is this you? Wow. He's there. I mean, he's everywhere, specifically where God is intervening in a mighty way. He's the means and the power of God, the Father. I'm going to read, before we move on uh, to his birth, his incarnation, there is a passage from 1 Corinthians, and I put on your notes another creedal perspective. Read it and agree with it. What did I say? Colossians. That's my default. So we're in first Corinth, uh, we're in Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Scott will edit that out. And so here is uh, a quite creedal and doctrinal statement from St. Paul about the Word of God who became flesh. I'll give you a second to turn. Go eat popcorn. Galatians and Ephesians. Gas Electric Power Company. Okay. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. Hold on to that, because we're going to be talking about it in just a second. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Wow. 
I won't say are there any questions because there are questions. Read this. Soak this up. When people have a problem with the creed and they don't have a problem with the Bible, I don't know how. Because the creed is pretty succinct. This is about four or five things about the Son of God. Scriptures really flesh it out. They work hand in hand. The Son of God. The Word of God. The Lamb of God. The Bread of God. The, the means and power of creation. The means and power of provision. The means and power of governance. The, fourth, the three things the Father does, creates, provides, governs. How does he do it? Through his word, through his son, through Jesus. We know his name. And that's something I need to say. The name of the Father is Yahweh. The name of the Son is Jesus. And if you hear the name of the Holy Spirit, let me know. Okay, so now we're going to look at the part of the creed. I've, I've got it in bold here. We'll jump just to the bold on the bottom of your page. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. So now we're talking about what I call the Christ event. We've mentioned before the five chapters of God's story. God created everything. God created covenantal timing. That's pretty much the whole Old Testament. The middle sea is God created the Christ event. He dwelled in human form for 33 years and performed the mighty work of salvation through that, atonement through that. He created the church and then the end will be the consummation. It's important to know where you live and act like it. There's a lot of people that live in the era of the church and think they live in the era of the Christ event. Just like there are a lot of people who lived in the era of the Christ event thought they lived in the era of the covenantal Old Testament. And they missed Jesus, didn't they? The church of Jesus Christ lives in a specific time a blessed time. It's been just under 2,000 years. And we need, to, we need to honor what God's doing today. We'll talk more about that when we're talking about the Holy Catholic Church, the Holy Universal Church. But for now, we're going to refer to the Christ event. Your first blank, there are four genealogies of Jesus Christ. Uh, Matthew 1. Luke 3. <coughs> John 1. And the entire Old Testament. <coughs> perspective here. In a moment, we're going to look at the genealogy of Jesus Christ from Matthew chapter 1 and the difference between that and the genealogy of Luke chapter 3. But if you were to boil down what we see in the genealogy of Matthew 1, this is the abridged version of the Old Testament. If you're a believer wanting to study the Old Testament, read it through the lineage of who Jesus is. There's almost a temptation to read the Old Testament backwards. But the Old Testament is the exhaustive... Uh, if you were to buy... What's that Family Tree software? Is it called Family Tree? Ancestry.com. Okay, so you go and buy the premier version of Ancestry.com. You're going to hear who your great-grandpappy's mailman was. You're going to learn... You're going to hear more than you thought you ever needed to know. The stories are great. The, the rabbit trails flesh out the story. But the most important thing is to remember and maintain the lineage of how we got to where we got. But this is a genealogy unlike all the others. Uh, maybe in the future, we'll take, a, a, we'll take time in this class to do that. We'll, we'll walk through the genealogy of Matthew 1 in, in the Old Testament. We'll, we'll follow that thread. It'll be pretty neat. So those, those are your four genealogies. Uh, Matthew 1, Luke 3, John 1. John 1, we're not going to touch on that because we just did. John 1 is the genealogy describing Jesus' divinity. It's very short. In the beginning, Jesus was there. Done. So we're going to look at Matthew first. If you turn to Matthew chapter 1, just to have it in front of you in case I 
Want to call on someone to read names? And watch you all. You're all avoiding eye contact with me right now. Okay, if you look at, at uh, Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, it says, a record, that this is, real quick, we have the Old and New Testament. The Old Testament goes from Genesis to Malachi. And then you get to the New Testament. The New Testament's first words are, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. First words of the New Testament. This is a book, a record of Jesus' genealogy. You can refer to that as just the book of Matthew or the entire New Testament. But it changes the way you look at the New Testament if you see the entire thing as this is who Jesus is. We're going to refer to the end of the New Testament in just a minute, but definitely the book of Matthew is a genealogy. Of course, Matthew, he's a unique gospel writer. He was a Jew, very Jewish, writing to a Jewish audience. He references the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, more than any of the, gospel, any of the other gospel writers. He is here to show to the Jew that Jesus is the Messiah. So he lays out a big case. Here's a blank for you. Matthew lays out Jesus Christ's legal and royal. Legal and royal line. Through who? His mother's husband, Joseph. Joseph. Yeah. We'll just read the end of it. Verse 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Now let's go ahead and jump down to, real quick, we'll fill them in and then go back. So you've got Matthew lays out, and you've got down below Luke lays out. You see that on your notes? Okay. Luke, chapter 3, lays out Jesus Christ's biological line through his mother, Mary. Yep. Luke lays out Jesus Christ biological line. Oh, you're, you're, uh, I think you're in the wrong spot. If you're confused, just don't write anything. We'll get, we'll walk down there in a minute. I just want you to see this real quick. There are two genealogies. Now you can look at them all different ways. One is ascending, one is descending. Uh, the first one is descending. It starts with Abraham. It goes down to Jesus Christ uh, through Joseph. The other one is ascending. It starts with Jesus. Well, Mary. And then it goes upward, not only to Abraham, but all the way to Adam. Interesting. So just hang with me for a minute. I've got a lot of points to make, and we'll wrap it up in the end. So Matthew lays out Jesus Christ's legal and royal line through his mother's husband, which is Joseph. As we go through this, this list, and we'll point out a few things in a minute, you'll notice in this list, and here's your first sub-blank, this was a lineage of sins and sinners. For instance... And it'll come true in this one. For instance, uh, someone read verse 6 for me. Mm -hmm. Jonna, can you do it? Never mind, someone who's on. Okay. Who was Uriah's wife? I forget. They refer to her, but won't even say her name. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about skeleton in your closet, right? We got to do the lineage. We got to go through this. So, so first off, you're gonna if you go through this list, if you walk through the Old Testament, 
holding on to this list. This is your map to know who to really pay attention to. Yeah, 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 there was, there was the prophet named Zadok. He's nice, I like him. But really, where are we going? Because there's David, and then there's Solomon, and then there's Rehob. You know, you go down the list. When you're following this list, you're going to see a multitude of sins and a multitude of sinners. That's number one. The second thing in this sub-blank is Matthew lists, here's a blank, five women. I'm just going to say that. We'll come back to it. Five women, which in that part of the world at that time was unheard of. Un unnecessary is what most people would say. Why are you listing the women? You only need to list the men. You only need to list the men and then the oldest son, and then the men and the oldest, right? You don't need to do that. All the women, forget that. So you've got that. But also, he lists five women, four of which are Gentiles. What? Verse 3, Judah, father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Tamar was a Canaanite. And uh, verse 5, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Rahab was a Canaanite prostitute. In fact, Tamar was a, an adulteress through incestual relationships. Uh, I'm not picking on the women, by the way. The guys are pieces of work, too. Uh, you've got Ruth, who was a Moabite. You've got uh, Bathsheba, who was... What's that? Who was, who was best? She, uh, she may have been a Jew, I don't know. Uh, and you've got Mary, but you've got someone else in there. Forget who. We, Mary's the last one? Okay. So it's starting to get interesting, this line, this lineage. And so when you're in it, and that would be a neat sermon series, let's talk about why that's included. Why are there five women, four of which are Gentiles, and what does that say about God's story? One thing it would say is that, we're going to get to this in the end and say it more emphatically, but if you think your lineage, if you think your adoption and movement into the family of God has anything to do with your morality, or your ability to be either more religious, some people are overly religious, they know church so well that they don't know Christ. Uh, or, if you believe that you're so immoral or someone you know is so immoral that they're past the point of no return, that's not in Scripture. That's not what we see. God, God adopted a lineage through this. It's messy. There are three primary sections. you notice there are groups of 14. David's repeated twice. You'll see in verse 6, one ends. It says, in Jesse, the father of King David, and then David's the first word of the next sentence. So it kind of messes it up. But... The first section, and you can write these blanks here, three sections. The first are the patriarchs. The second section are the kings. And hold on real quick. The kings is where it got messy, messy, messy where you have every other king, and he was an abomination to the Lord. He was a bad king. If you go read Chronicles 1st and 2nd, it gets it likes to point those things out. And so, you've got the patriarchs, the next section were the kings, and the kings ended with the deportation of Babylon. So the last section, I like to pro call preserved. Humbled, a lot, however you want to put it. This last section is connected to the patriarchs, is connected to the kings, but by the time it comes to fruition with the Christ, what is Joseph doing for a living? He's a carpenter, a minority living under Roman rule. He's not impressive. He has no secular power. The lineage is there, but they're quite preserved. The, 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 uh, uh, they're, they're humbled and preserved. This began with the deportation, with the ending of the royal um, overt reign. And there's a last piece we need to talk about. 
If you notice in verse 11 of Matthew 1, right before the deportation, it says, And Josiah was the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. Jeconiah, if we turn to Jerusalem, up to Jerusalem, Jeremiah, who you know, walk Jerusalem. We see a specific curse this king is described as a ring on God's hand that's being taken off. Jeremiah, it's on your notes. Jeremiah 22, 30. I just listened to this because we're going to flip right back. This is what the Lord says. Record this man as if he were childless. A man who will not prosper in his lifetime. For none of his offspring will prosper None will sit on the throne of David or rule anymore in Judah. Whoa. So, right before the deportation, this judgment comes from the mouth of the Lord through the prophet Jeremiah referring to this king. King Jeconiah, here's a, here's a blank. The descendants will not sit on David's throne. Hold that thought. Now, Luke, you can study. Well, I'm going to stay on Matthew just because you get mixed up with every. You'll need to print them out and look at them simultaneously. But I'll teach you just a couple things real quickly. Again, Luke lays out Jesus Christ's biological line through his mother, Mary. The break between the lineage shown from of Jesus between Mary and Joseph, the break is who follows King David. Solomon or Nathan? Circle Nathan. Nathan is who Mary is traced back to. I'm going to read something kind of interesting when I was studying it this morning. I love, I love the phrasing. I I don't pick up on a lot of things if you're reading fast, and, and this, was, this was an interesting way to put it. Verse 23 of Luke 3, you can just listen to this. Now Jesus himself was about 33 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph. Joseph was not his dad. Uh, I like that little phrase thrown into to, to Joseph, or th thrown about Jesus and Joseph together. And so you already have this thing prefaced that there's a little wiggle room here. Like we're trying to figure this thing out. He's not Joseph, so what was thought. And so Luke has a different thing he's talking about. He's going all the way back. And if you if you follow the lineage of the biological line of Mary, it goes up through through Nathan, not Solomon, which means, and here's a blank. Mary and Joseph are actually distant cousins. So get your jokes out now. Good thing they didn't have Jesus. The Holy Spirit had Jesus. Okay. And so here's the distinction we're going to... It's talked about in Romans, and we've talked about it in this class. Here's a blank. The promised children of Abraham would be God's gift and choosing. We mentioned before, and we're going to write something else here in a second, but... St. Paul refers to the children of Abraham as the children of the promise, not, not the sperma, the, the, just simply because your, your father's sperm did this and made you, you know, 
that doesn't that doesn't give you the label of being a promised heir of Abraham. The difference is of that uh, Jewish lineage, there is a remnant, a portion, who have a gift put in them to hunger for God's righteousness. And so we start seeing these distinctives between there's now technically yes we're all of this inheritance or of this ancestry. But we all have that cousin. <laughs> or like, there's something weird here, or special here. And so, so what we see in Mary is different than what everyone knows as this massive royal line of King David and kings. Mary's lineage goes back a different way. Of course, the full conception is going to come by the Holy Spirit. But we're going to see what God does here, holding these two thoughts in tension. But if you go all the way back to Genesis 2, uh, 21, Chapter, uh, verse 2, if you, I was reading NIV, they used a different phrase. It says that the father graced Sarah. This is when Sarah is old and she cannot conceive, and yet they've had a, a children promised to them. And, and so, because there was the promise, Abraham took it upon himself to sleep with his uh, concubine, and she had a son named Ishmael, and Ishmael was not one of the children of Abraham. One of the promised children. He was one of the kids of Abraham. He should be paying child support. But... <laughs> It's not one of the promised children of God through Abraham. That's Isaac. And if you read in Hebrew, in, I've got a quote for you. In Genesis 21, 2, at the right time, the Lord visited Sarah and she conceived. Now, I don't know what that means. You can interpret that however you want. But that's pretty impressive. It's pretty impressive that someone of her age with a womb that has never born a child all of a sudden can conceive. And it's impressive that a young girl, 12, 14 years old, has never had sexual relations in her life conceived. There's a little foreshadowing here is what I'm saying. Mary, likewise, was visited. And what we have on this final blank here is that Jesus came through Mary, but by God's choosing and timing. I have a point here, don't worry. You've got two genealogies. Matthew 1 represents Joseph's line, the legal line. That's why they went to Bethlehem to register. He's of David. He's of the, the people of David. Also in that line, we have a curse that says no longer. Joseph's lineage is not it because of that one king, right? Can't sit on the throne. So here's your blank. Joseph did not adopt Jesus. Jesus adopted Joseph and Joseph's line. He didn't come through all those people. What I'm saying is, you've got a father who operates outside of time and who holds a beginning and end and makes promises and intervenes in certain periods of time. And at his choosing, while he's watching this conversation, he's doing things at other times and places. At his choosing, he performed the Christ event. And if you look at it, what this means is that the Old Testament and the New Testament are giant fingers pointing to the same thing. The Old Testament is pointing forward. The New Testament is pointing backward. That everything on earth finds its meaning and purpose and hope from the same event. Jesus adopted backward and forward. The Old Testament doesn't make sense without the adoption of Jesus. It's just a bunch of stories of violence and, and, and power grabs. But all of a sudden, here Jesus is, who has taken this lineage that had been promised that no child born of this lineage will have the kingdom, will, will reign. And so God provided by the Holy Spirit, not by anyone, not by, not by sperma, not by human choice or will. God is the one that brought his son to live on earth so that he could do all this adopting. Forward and backward. 
Judaism is not fulfilled until Christ. They know about the Messiah. The Jewish mind is that the Messiah will come through the lineage. The Christian mind is that God will provide the Savior and make the lineage actually mean something for once. It's reverse. And that's where we get to this whole concept. Jesus Christ is not chosen. He chooses us. We don't adopt him. He adopts us. I know that Joseph is the adult in the room, but he didn't adopt Jesus. God sent him through Mary to stand and be part of this family to make it matter backward and to make it matter forward. Whoa! That's why it's tempting to read the Old Testament almost in reverse to see how this dominoed back. Promise made to Abraham came true in Jesus. And it's still coming true today. And so if you want to consider it this way, the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1 and Revelation 22, 21 together. These are the first and last words of the, of the New Testament. First words of the New Testament. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Revelation 22. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. He's talking about family here. Everything in between exalts and talks about the ins and outs, the hows, the whys, the winds of the Christ event that has taken full effect for the future and the past. The virgin birth is important <laughs> so that we don't get confused, so that we don't think Jesus is a product of humans and that he owes us anything. And that if it hadn't been for this preserved line, then there would be no Jesus. Fooey on that, there was no preserved line. Technically there was, but it was a cursed line. So that Jesus could flow upstream. The virgin birth is important. I've heard challenges on it. I've, uh, I've, I, and I, I don't. You can do theological gymnastics all you want. I've, I've heard the phrase, even even the devil knows the Bible. It, <laughs> congratulations, that virgin can also mean young girl. Whoop de doo. I, I I don't know. Uh, what does that do for you? But because Jesus was born. Uh, conceived because God's timing and God's choosing. Just as he visited Sarah, now he's visiting Mary. When he did these things, he started something powerful that we had no say in. We can't make God move. We can't make God adopt us. We cannot make God produce the Christ event. It's his doing, his timing for his glory. And it includes our adoption. That's the story of the Christ event. Your last blank. Is like your first. Jesus Christ is always the power and means of the Father's will. Oh yeah. The Son of God puts on flesh to adopt sinners. backward and forward. And after he did it that way, he descended, didn't he? That's what the creed says. And he ascended. He's going... To... There are different ways to look at this. Luke 19.10, it's the story of Zacchaeus. It was, it seemed like we read that recently. Did the elders do that? Yeah. Luke 19.10, Luke is the only non-Jewish writer. He didn't walk with Jesus. He just had visions of Christ. And he wrote this as a Gentile, as an outsider. It's only in Luke. Maybe we should do a study in Luke. Luke is the one that has the outsiders. He's the one that has the shepherds who would have been left out. He's just, he's a different kind of writer. He looks from a different angle. He looks, he's, he's the, the gospel of lost and found. The prodigal son, which we're not supposed to use that word, I know, but the lost sheep, the lost coin, only in Luke, Luke 15. In Luke 19.10, he shows his cards. Every gospel writer will do it at some point if you watch for it. He shows all of his cards, and he says, The Son of Man came to find, to save, and seek the lost. 
And the question is, the lost who? The lost chosen? The, right, that's where you get, lost is an adjective. Yeah. The son of man came to seek out and save the red. The red, the red bouncy balls? The red, what, the red flowers? The red backpacks? What, what? <laughs> and so you got to start asking the question, when the Son of Man came in flesh to inaugurate the great work of the will of the Father, to adopt, who is he adopting? What is he looking for? When he came to Zacchaeus climbing up in the tree, he said, to this day, at this day, salvation has come to you. What about all those poor people in the crowd? Why did he say that? I don't know. I don't know. But we know the Son of Man sailed across. He went the most... <laughs> he, his travel schedule was really weird. He would be doing something here, and he would sail across to go deal with a guy that was full of demons, and he would cast them out the swine, and the guy became a believer, and he went... And then he went right back the way he came. Like, why did he do that later? Why, he had a specific objective and timing. He says over and over again to different people. To this guy, yes. To this person, you, won't, you can't put your hand in the plow and then look back. To the rich young ruler, no. Hmm. I, it's the craziest thing. It's the most scandalous thing. But Jesus walked around in flesh and even does it through this day through the power of his Holy Spirit, adopting sinners as God's kids. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. And so when we're talking about the son and his conception and his birth into humanity, just, just receive it. <laughs> Don't question it. It's so good. It's so right. It's so given and revealed and handed to the church. And it's important that we maintain. It's important that we don't have to challenge every single thing. But that Jesus' birth by Mary and conception by the Holy Ghost was so that no one could say, He came because I made Him. We made, we forced God's hand. Or we preserved the perfect lineage. Or I behaved the perfect way. Or, or however, no. We were done. And He came and adopted us. Forwards and backwards. Let's pray. Father, we stand in awe of your, of your activity. We try to count your, your wisdom. And even though we're, we display it as the church, you've anointed us to display your wisdom, things that we don't even understand all the time. And whenever we have a moment to just see what you've done, things that have been available to us we haven't seen yet, when we see what you've done, it's so beautiful. Who is like our God? And when we see the way you did it every time through Jesus, that you always act by your word, by your provision, by Jesus every time. It's Jesus Christ. Father, may you grow our esteem for him. Grow in our church a deep desire and, and appreciation and testifying spirit of, of all the times Jesus Christ has, has been the one you sent to produce miracles and healings. That the physician's hands every time, Father, that, that we know that only Jesus gives sight to the blind. Anytime we've had a gift of new creation and sight, seeing something in Scripture or in the hearts of another, in Jesus' name, we praise you that that was Christ Jesus given to us. And we praise you above everything that you have adopted your church forwards and backwards. Even down into Hades, Jesus went. We praise you for his work. And we hope, Lord, we pray that you hear us. And we know, Father, you're raining down your spirit so that we live, live, live obediently as our great thankfulness and thanks. Uh, thank you, Note, for who you are and what you've done. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.